started. <clears throat> we left off, I believe, on 204. <clears throat> Malfoy tries to hit Harry with a spell because Harry insults Malfoy's mother. He doesn't literally insult her. He just describes her as she looks. Um, and Harry turns his back to him and Malfoy shoots a spell at him. 204. Moody intervenes. Okay. <clears throat> and he's walking down the marble staircase and suddenly where Malfoy was standing, there's now a white ferret. Moody stops Crab and Goyle from grabbing the ferret. And we see him raise his wand, point it at the ferret, and say, never do that again. Okay? Raising the ferret up in the air and smacking it on the ground. Now, if you don't know anything about ferrets, you used to have a couple of them, ferrets are very, very delicate animals. I mean, one of my sons had a couple of ferrets, had a cage that was like this tall, and one of the ferrets, because it crawl all over it, one of the ferrets fell from the top of the cage to the bottom, broke its back. I mean, like, literally, two and a half feet, okay? So here's Malfoy going from like six feet in the air, wham, wham, each time. Um, not, not nice, essentially. And so McGonagall comes in and she asks, you know, Moody what he's doing. You're not disciplining, you're not using transfiguration, are you? Is it really that he's using the transfiguration to discipline Malfoy, or is it the, the being smacked on the ground that is disciplining Malfoy? So she says, we don't do that. And he goes, okay. So he talks to Snape, uh, he talks to Malfoy, and said, um, when 206, Malfoy says, my father, he says, I know your father of old boy. You tell him Moody's keeping a close eye on him. You tell him that for me. Now your head of house is Snape, right? He says, yeah. He says, yeah, another old friend. Tell him I'll be talking to him too, you know. So Ron and Harry just want to sear that memory in their minds forever. And we get chapter 14, The Unforgivable Curses. First class with Moody, Defense Against the Dark Arts. And he tells them he's only going to be there a year. Doesn't say why. Ron's like, no, you got to last more than more than a year. But we find out later why it's really only a year. It's more than just what he says here. And he says, all right, 211, bottom of the page. Curses. Because they're behind on curses. He says they come in all kinds of strengths and forms. According to the Ministry of Magic, I'm only supposed to teach you counter curses and leave it at that. Okay, so think of the logic of that. I'm going to teach you counter curses. If you're going to learn the counter curses, don't you need to know what you're countering? That's his logic. You're not, I'm not supposed to show you what illegal dark curses look like until you're in the sixth year. You're not supposed to be old enough to deal with it till then. For those of you who've read all seven novels, do they go over dark curses in, in book six? Do they learn what dark curses look like in book six? No, they don't. So, but Professor Dumbledore's <coughs> got a higher opinion of your nerves. He reckons you can cope. In other words, Dumbledore thinks what about them? They're old enough. We already heard Arthur Weasley say, you're not old enough, you wouldn't understand. Now Moody is telling them, Dumbledore thinks you are old enough to understand. Later on in Padfoot Returns, which I hope we'll get to, I'm going to skip some that I shouldn't, um, Sirius is going to say, well, you're too young, you wouldn't understand. 
And Ron gets a little exasperated and says, you know, my dad said that at the Quidditch World Cup. Why don't you try us? And Sirius gets this grin on his face like, yes. An equal, you know. <laughs> so, he says, any of you know which curses, page 212, are most heavily punished by wizarding law? Bunch of hands go up, and he points to Ron. Imperious or something? He says, yep, your father would know about that one. Gave the ministry a lot of trouble. And he goes to his desk, pulls out the drawer. Out of the drawer, he pulls out a big glass jar. Pulls a spider out. Okay? Holds the spider in his hand. Takes his other hand and goes, Imperio. And the spider leaps, hanging from a thread like a trapeze artist. Okay? Everyone laughs. Think it's funny, do you? You'd like it, would you, if I did it to you? And they stop. Why? Because that's kind of a threat. You're laughing at the spider. Want me to do it to you? No, 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 no. Total control. I can make it jump out of the window, drown itself, throw itself down. One of your throats. <laughs> Ron, you know, <laughs> shudders. So he says, years back, lots of witches and wizards were controlled by the Imperious Curse. It can be fought, though, and I'll be teaching you how. It takes real strength of character. Not everyone's got it. Okay? Constant vigilance. What's another one? Hermione's hand goes up. So does Neville's. Neville looked surprised at his own daring. He says, yes. Uh, Cruciatus, your name's Longbottom. So he pulls out another spider. Needs to be a bit bigger. That is, you got to really be able to see this one. So he takes the spider that, I don't know, is maybe the size of my thumbnail, and in Gorgio, and now it's the size of a tarantula. So it's big. Okay. Crucio in the spider plops on its back, legs curl in, and it just twitches. It kind of rocks back and forth. No sound, but Harry was sure if it had given voice, it would have been screaming. And Hermione says, stop it. Why? She's not looking at the spider. She's looking at Neville. Neville's hands are like this, so that the knuckles are white. He's squeezing all the blood out of his hands. And his eyes are white, are wide and horrified. Reducio. And the spider goes back to its normal shape. And he picks it up and puts it back in the jar. Pain. You don't need thumb screws or knives to torture someone if you can perform the Cruciatus curse. That one was very popular too. Notice, thumb screws and knives leave what? Scars. Crucio doesn't necessarily leave a scar. Okay? Anybody know of any others? Harry looks around. <laughs> like, anybody? Please don't make me be the one to. Hermione. Fada Cadavra? Ah, oh, the last and worst. Reaches in for the spider, the one that hasn't been zapped yet, and that poor sucker is trying to get away. It's like the spider understands English. And he puts it on the desktop. And he roars, top of his lungs, Avada Kedavra. Why? Because you have to say it loudly? Or could he just go, Avada Kedavra, it's dead. I think it's for effect. I think it's entirely for effect. He's going to tell them during this year, you could all pull out your wands and say Avada Kedavra, point your wands at me and I probably wouldn't get as much as a bloody nose. So 
flash of blinding green light, rushing sound as though a vast invisible something was soaring through the air, and the spider Not nice. Understatement of the year, right? Not nice. Not pleasant. No counter curse. No blocking it. Hmm. True or false? Only one known person has ever survived it, and he's right there. And Harry's like, really? Again? You know, hello everybody, it's me, Scarhead, you know. Harry's seen that green light before, right? He's experienced it in his dreams. What was the sound? As though a vast invisible something was soaring through the air. Was that the life of the spider being sucked out? Or was that death coming to claim it? I have no idea, by the way. Harry's going to hear that sound again. End of this book. Okay, He's going to see the light again, too. Even though his eyes are closed, he's still going to see the light. Not, <laughs> not quote-unquote, see the light, but, you know, you get the idea. Okay, So... He's thinking of his parents' death, et cetera, et cetera. So Moody goes on. There's no counter curse. So if there's no counter curse, tooth 17, why am I showing you? Right? Think about this for a minute. If there's nothing you can do to stop Avada Kedavra, what does it matter? I can't protect you against it. He says, because you've got to know. You need to know what the worst is you'll have to face. You've got to appreciate what the worst is. You don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're facing it. The point? Don't put yourself in a situation where you can have to face Avada Kedavra. Like, I don't know. Don't go hang out at dark arts bars or something like that. Constant vigilance. What's it mean to be vigilant? Aware. Aware. To be always on the lookout. Okay? You guys don't remember because you're all too young. I mean, a couple of you might. After 9-11. Man, we were hyper constantly vigilant. And then a month and a half after 9-11, we had the anthrax attacks. And then it was either that same year or the year after, it all mushes together in my pre-Alzheimer's mind, we had the Washington, D.C. sniper attacks. And we thought, okay, this is more of the same. And then we had other attacks, bomb threats and such, such that I don't think it's this way in the U.S. still. But if you go to England, if you have trash like that, there, I'm assuming that's trash, and, and you eat at a Chick-fil-A or a Starbucks or something, and you've got trash and you're outside the building, there's nowhere to throw the trash away in London. They don't have trash cans out anymore because of the bomb threats. Okay? Constant vigilance. So he goes on and talks about those are the unforgivable curses. Use of any one of them on a fellow human being is enough to earn a life sentence in Azkaban. That's what you're up against. Very next lesson. I'm going to put you all under the appearance curse. Which means I can go to Azkaban. Okay? So why doesn't he? Because he's mad I'm Moody. Who's going to be damn fool enough to try to take him? It's not going to be Dumbledore, because Dumbledore is the one who told him essentially to do it. So, they leave class, and what do they think? Whew. I mean, we thought Lupin was cool. Okay, crazy, but he knows his stuff, right? Um, Moody takes Neville under his wing, you know, kind of later and such. So we're going to skip a bunch. We're, we're skipping in a whole bunch. End of that chapter, 226, 227, Harry gets a letter back from Sirius. Remember, he wrote him after a star hurt? 
He says, I'm flying north immediately. News about your scar. It's the latest in a series of strange rumors that have reached me. Go straight to Dumbledore if it hurts again. He's got Mad-Eye out of retirement, which means he's reading the signs. What signs? What was a sign that we heard repeatedly in book one? In one chapter. Mars is bright tonight. It was said like four times. Why is that significant? If Mars is in the ascendance, Mars is the god of war. Get ready. Okay? And we can jump to the very last chapter, the beginning. What's the beginning? beginning of the war okay so here he thinks 227 goes to bed he's thinking of Sirius's letter if Sirius gets caught if Sirius came back and got caught it would be his Harry's fault what lesson did Harry not learn in the book three Harry told Vo Harry told Voldemort Wow. Harry told Dumbledore in the book three. If Voldemort comes back, it's my fault. Why? What assumption is he making? I saved Peter Pettigrew. Peter Pettigrew is going to go back to Voldemort. And he's going to help Voldemort rise again. Right? Because in that assumption, what is Harry assuming about the prophecy he heard? What was the prophecy? The servant of the Dark Lord, chained for the last 12 years, will escape tonight. He will help the Dark Lord revive. The servant of the Dark Lord. Play it again. That's why I asked the question. Who's the servant? Is it Peter Pettigrew? What form has he been in for 12 years? Head, head, sorry. Had he been in for 12 years? A rat. Okay. Why has it, or how has Harry not learned the lesson? What is he assuming about his actions? That they take precedence over everybody else's. I mean, in one sense, it's really egotistical on his part. He's saying, he's thinking, I saved Peter Pettigrew, therefore, Voldemort will rise again. What is he taking away? What's he taking away from Peter Pettigrew? His own choices. His own choices. What are they going to learn about in their next defense against the Dark Arts class? What spell will Moody put him under? Imperial. Which does what? Take away free will. Takes away your free will. Harry mentally is denying. Peter Pettigrew's free will. He's merely assuming Pettigrew is going to do something. He has no proof. He's a rat. Why wouldn't a rat just run down to a sewer and escape and try and stay as far away as possible? Okay. Bobaton and Durmstrang. Harry writes back to Sirius. Don't bother. Don't come up north. Stay hidden, essentially. Okay? So, 231. 230. 231. Defense against the dark arts. Moody says, I'm going to put you under the imperious curse. Hermione's like, what? You just said it's illegal and that you could get sent to Azkaban. Square that circle. And he essentially says, no. I don't have to answer to you. If you don't want to learn what it's going to be like, there's the door. Go ahead. Pick it. Go. And Hermione doesn't leave. Why not? I'm not going to miss this. It's, you know, really good practical learning. So, <clears throat> Moody starts putting the students through their paces, so to speak. 
We see Dean Thomas hop three times around the room singing the national anthem. Lavender Brown imitates a squirrel. Neville becomes a gymnast, etc. Potter, you're next. Harry goes up in the middle of the classroom. Imperio. It was the most, page 231. It was the most wonderful feeling. Harry felt a floating sensation as every thought and worry in his head was wiped gently away, leaving nothing but a vague, untraceable happiness. Why? Why does being put under the imperious curse leave a vague, untraceable happiness? Because his free will is gone, so his worries are taken away? His free will is gone, so... His worries are taken His away. His worries are taken away. Okay. What else? Okay. Though he does in just a moment. What else? Ignorance is I think that's what she's kind of implying through that. Ignorance. Literally not knowing is what that word means. So to be ignorant is not a necessarily a bad thing. Like, if one of you is an accounting major, and you came up to me and started talking to me about accounting, I would say, totally ignorant. You might as well just be going blah, 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 because I don't understand it. Or, you know, recording industry major in the technology used. Whoosh, right? Not knowing. But what is implied with this knowing? What has to be there? First, it's a precondition for knowing. This. The I. Okay? So what does the imperious curse do? What does every work of fiction in every work of drama, in every film, which are nothing but fiction and drama, put on the cellulite, involve. What must they have first? It's got to be, it's central to every one of them. It's not central to poetry. You don't have to have this element in poetry. Knowledge, character, emotion. Knowledge, character, emotion. Nope, nope, nope. Just rapid fire. What else? What is central, in a sense, to human existence? We don't like to think of it, which is probably why you're not thinking of it. Intelligence? No. Is it a mind? I don't know. How's the word in? Conflict. Conflict. Every work of fiction has conflict. Why? Because you have a protagonist, the one who suffers the most, and an antagonist, usually the one or the thing that causes the suffering. Protagonist, every book is titled what? Neville Longbottom and the Chamber of Secrets. No. <laughs> Harry Potter, protagonist. <laughs> Who's the antagonist? Overall, it's Voldemort. But there's a lot of little antagonists, right? Malfoy's an antagonist. At some point, Hermione's an antagonist. Uh, Neville's an antagonist. Book four, Ron's going to be an antagonist. Book seven, Ron's going to be an antagonist. You know, life can be antagonistic, right? You wake up and you go, well, let me just go back and sleep forever. <laughs> okay? What is central to conflict? Where does every conflict begin? It's in here. How? Because it's the opposition of what's in here with what's out there. That's, I mean, that's the ultimate conflict. Because all of you won't do what? Yeah, it's kind of what I'm getting at, but it's not the way I want you to put it. 
which is again going against what? My will. Right? The world would be perfect in what situation? The world would be perfect for you. How? If everybody else did what you want them to do. And for you, it would be if everybody else did what you want. Them. And we could go all the way around the room, 15 different people, and there'd be what? 15 different perfect worlds. The only problem is, this is my world. Like within these four walls. <laughs> Outside, have at it, you know. That's, this, that's the conflict. The conflict is between the I and the, what a Jewish theologian named, and psychoanalyst, I think he was, uh, named Martin Buber, called the thou. That is everything that is not I. So this could be thou, and this could be thou, and this is definitely, you know, everything else, okay? Notice what the imperious curse does by the way, that is similar to something we were introduced to in the previous book. It, at least temporarily in Harry's case, it takes away the I. What's the I possibly emblematic of? The soul. The imperious curse is like a temporary Dementor's kiss. Because what's left? after the Dimitris kiss. It's just the body, right? There's no I there anymore. There's no me there anymore. Okay? So, Harry feels total bliss. Why? There's nothing opposing his will because he doesn't have a will anymore. His eye has left the room temporarily. He stood there feeling immensely relaxed, only dimly aware. Why is he dimly aware? Because the imperious curse isn't total. It doesn't completely remove the eye. If it did, it would be what? Yeah. Then it would be the Dementor's kiss. It'd be the death of the soul. So, and then he hears mad -Eye. Jump onto the desk. Jump onto the desk. Bends his knees. He's getting ready. Jump onto the desk. Third time it said. Why though? Notice something awakens. Another voice had awoken in the back of his mind, in the back of his brain. Stupid thing to do, really, said the voice. Why jump on the desk? That's a dumb thing to do. No, I don't think I will think, said the other voice a little more firmly. No, I don't really want to. Notice what's just been said. I don't want to. The soul, the self, the I is reasserting itself. Okay? Jump! No! That's a command, by the way. And so, Harry kind of jumps. <laughs> he jumps and doesn't jump at the same time. Now that's more like it, says Moody. Look at that, you lot. Potter fought. Did Dean Thomas fight? Did Lavender fight? Did Neville fight? No, they went dancing around and chirping like a squirrel and without any problem. So why did Harry? What does it take to repel it? And notice, by the way, we're told, bottom of 232, Harry says, the way he talks, you'd think we were all going to be attacked any second. Go back to the line before you'd think. Moody had insisted on putting Harry through his paces four times in a row until Harry could throw off the curse entirely. I think that means fourth attempt, Harry doesn't do it at all. Harry asserts the I, the self, the soul. Now, 
we were told earlier, back at the Quidditch World Cup, we weren't given a number. We were kind of given an amount. How many people have been put under the Imperius curse before, like during Voldemort's rise to power and such? A lot. An awful lot. A very large number. Which means they couldn't fight it off. They couldn't repel it. Harry's barely 14 years old. And he's just, you know, on the fourth attempt. Go away, you're bothering me. So how can Harry have strength of character? How do you get strength of character? What do, I've never been in the military, had friends who were, Better. What's one of the purposes of boot camp? Is it to build you up? Well, what does it do first? It breaks you down. It breaks you down. It breaks down the what? The I. To create the we. You're part of a unit. All right? It creates that. So how does it do that? This. What builds character outside the military? Trials and tribulations. Bingo. Adversity. Adversity builds character. How many of you have known someone? Notice I didn't say, how many of you, <laughs> I'm going to distance it, how many of you have known someone who's pretty much had a pretty easy life? They, they haven't had to suffer much. They haven't had to work hard. And I mean work hard. Like you're sore and tired at the end of a day. Your hands hurt. Your muscles hurt. Okay? If you've known someone who's never had any of that, what kind of life do they generally have? It's soft. It's easy. I've got colleagues who talk about the hard work of teaching. Hell no. <laughs> Standing up here in front of four classes or five classes or three, this is not hard work. When my dad owned a lawn business and my brother and I were digging ditches to put in sprinkler system, that's hard work because we did it with a pick, at, pick and axe and shovel. This is, you know, not using a ditch witch and other stuff. Back breaking, tiring, that's what builds this kind of character. So how did Harry get this? What does he have to do seemingly with Dudley every day or from Dudley every day? Dodge a punch, you know, hide from him. It's why he finds himself up on the roof of the gymnasium when Dudley and his gang are chasing him and such. Okay? Harry's had a lot of adversity in his life. Why can he produce the expecto patronum. Or excuse me, why do the Dementors affect Harry the way they do? Because he has a much more horrendous past than do others. And yet, what? He's still standing up. He still goes on every day. So, Keep going on. Triwizard Tournament is announced and such. They talk about house elves. Harry gets his next letter from Sirius. Um, the Bobaton students and Durmstrang students arrive. Skipping a lot. Goblet of Fire chapter where we kind of get introduced to, I don't think we've heard about her before. Might have been Cho. Um, 255 and following. Dumbledore talks about the Triwizard Tournament, how the champions will be selected and such. Goblet of Fire, and he's going to draw an age line around it. Okay? Only someone who is 17 will be able to get past the age line. And he says, don't try to violate this. All right? Why? If your name comes out, you have to compete. 
He says, 256, the placing of your name in the goblet constitutes a binding magical contract. There can be no change of heart once you have become a champion. Earlier, just before that, if you've been selected by the Goblet of Fire, he or she is obliged to see the tournament through to the end. And I've got written off to, my, uh, off to the margin. Similar to something we're going to see in book six. It's actually similar to two things we're going to see in book six. Okay? I'm not going to say what they are. Hopefully you'll make the connection. So, we're going to skip a bit again. Two, nah, not even going to talk about that. The Goblet of Fire spits out its name. 269. Durmstrang. Victor Crumb comes out. Once they knew Victor Crumb was a student at Durmstrang, you knew this guy's going to be the champion. Okay? The Bobatons. Fleur de la Cour. What's her name mean? Fleur, flower, de la Cour, of the heart. Oh, isn't that sweet? She's a Vila also. And yet, most of the Bobatons apparently aren't happy that she's been chosen. Durmstrangers are fairly pleased with Crumb's choice, right? Why not with Fleur? She's a Vila. Okay. Why else? Are the other female students at Bobaton Vila? No. Some are. I think it's implied. Okay. Is she really the best? It's kind of implied. Fleur's pretty, she's a Vila, so maybe she isn't really pretty. Maybe it's the Vila, what? Her Vila-ishness? Vila-ishness? I don't know what the word would be. Um, that makes people think she is, okay? But it's also kind of implied that the other Bobatons, mm, they kind of look down on her. And maybe it's jealousy because she's a Vila, okay? Hogwarts? Pretty boy. No other way to describe Cedric. That's why, he's, that's why you know, all the girls like him, because he's cute, all right? Cedric Diggory. So they all go on, uh, go on up to the room behind where, you know, they're all meeting. And like a few seconds later, after everyone thinks it's all done, the fire spews out again, and up comes Harry's name. I didn't put my name in. You know I didn't. Harry says to Ron and Hermione. They just stare blankly back. Why blankly? Kind of in shock. In shock, surprised. Could it also be liar, liar, pencil on fire, you know? Mm -hmm. So McGonagall calls Harry, takes him to the room where the other champions are. Harry sees Dumbledore, Crouch, Karkaroff, Madame Maxime, McGonagall, Snape, who isn't there yet? He's going to come in shortly. Moody, okay. And notice, Fleur is like, he cannot be one, he is too young. Cr Crumb doesn't say anything, and Cedric doesn't say anything. All right? Madame Maxime does, Karkaroff does, Snape does does, interestingly, Snape should be going, yay, another Hogwarts champion, but it's Harry, boo, you know. So, 276, Dumbledore asks Harry a question. Should it be Dumbledore? Should it be Bagman and Crouch? Bagman and Crouch are judges for the Triwizard Tournament, but this is Dumbledore school, you know, where it's, it's, his eye that gets to determine everything here. Did you put your name into the Goblet of Fire? No. Did you ask an older student to? No. Madame Maxine, he's lying. Okay. What happened to Fred and George? 
when they tried to put their names in. They ate. Big long beards, white hair, the whole nine yards. Okay, Madame Maxine. Uh, excuse me, McGonagall. He couldn't have crossed the age line. I'm sure we're all agreed on that. Dumbledore must have made a mistake with the line. She's like, that's my headmaster you're talking about. Just Dumbledore, it's possible. All throughout the books, what is Dumbledore the first to admit? I can make mistakes. But he usually then goes on and says, but when I do, who? they're biggies. Why? Because I'm brilliant, you know. So, McGonagall, Dumbledore, you know perfectly well you did not make a mistake. She's his defender, his patronus of sorts, right? So, Bagman and Crouch, when Carcross says, come on, what are the rules here? You just, this, this, it's not the quad wizard tournament. It's the tri wizard tournament. Got to follow the rules, Barty Crutch says. Telling us what about him? Got to follow the letter of the law. Okay. Moody comes in. And what does Moody introduce into the discussion? Why might someone have put Harry's name in the goblet? Trying to get him killed. Trying to get him killed. Notice, Moody's previous job was what? Auror, hunter of dark wizards. Okay. So what what's his modus operandi? What does he how does he think in the quote unquote real world? Everybody's out to get me. I mean, if you're a spy, if you're a spook, CIA, in whatever, pick your alphabet group, um, and you go undercover for a while, what's the danger? The, this has happened. Okay, yeah, that's a danger being discovered. What's another danger? You go under for too long, you're playing a role that role starts to become your reality and you kind of forget who you are. Moody's not going to let that happen so what does he assume? Not about everybody but about most people he doesn't know. Stop. Oh, it's a phone call. I thought it was, yeah, it's close enough. He assumes what about everybody else? Gotta take these. They're dark wizards, right? Why does um, I almost said Alfred, not Albert? I'll get his name in a moment. Arthur Weasley. Why does Arthur Weasley have to rescue him at the beginning of the book? He heard a noise and did what? He attacked his trash can. We're going to find out later. There was probably more involved than that, but anyways. He's got to think like dark wizards. So he assumes people are naturally evil, bad. Does Harry assume that about everybody? No. Does Dumbledore assume that about everybody? No. We're going to have a conversation with Hagrid later on. Where Haggard is going to say, Dumbledore says essentially what about people? Or believes what about people? Everybody. Worthy of a second chance. Okay? So, conversation ends. Dumbledore sends Harry and Cedric up to bed, bottom of 282. Harry and Cedric are alone. They're in the Great Hall making their way to their respective dormitories. And Cedric says, tell me, how did you get your name in? What's that telling us Cedric thinks? Harry put his name in. Harry put his name in. And ergo, therefore, Harry lied to all of them just now when he said, I didn't put my name in. Harry, I didn't. I didn't. 
put it in. I was telling the truth. What house is Cedric in? What characterizes Hufflepuffs? Loyal, honest, just, and true. Okay? If you are loyal, honest, just, and true, and someone essentially says, I swear to you, I didn't do this thing, what should you do? You should believe that person. But he doesn't. Huh, okay, well, see ya. In other words, <laughs> right. I don't believe you. Harry goes on up to the Gryffindor common room. Big party being thrown. Yay, Harry Potter, you know. He and one other person are the last two to leave. Who's the other person? Say it loud. Ron. Ron. Why? Because Ron wants to ask Harry the exact same question Cedric just did. How'd you do it? I didn't. Because, you know, if it was the invisibility cloak, where's Ron going with that? We could have both done it. We could have both fit under the invisibility cloak and crossed over the age line. What's bothering Ron? Harry did something about him. Harry didn't give him the opportunity to do it, too. What else is bothering Ron? Harry got picked for something again. Really? Harry again? What's Ron seemingly always going to be when Harry is around? Sidekick. Sidekick in his shadow. What did Ron say when he looked in the mirror? He was himself. <laughs> Nobody else. Notice, not only his family wasn't there. Harry wasn't there either. It was Ron, big man on campus, you know, so to speak. Okay. Ron says, 287, you know, you said this morning, you'd have done it last night, and no one would have seen you. I'm not stupid, you know. Doing a good impression of it, Harry says. Okay. So what happens to the three musketeers from this point for quite a while? Kind of get broken up. Yeah, we're down to the two musketeers and the loser, Ron. Okay. Bit of foreshadowing, by the way for those who aren't familiar with it yet. So we get the weighing of the wands. Notice Ron's last words to Harry are, oh yeah, right, you better go to bed early because you might have an important photo shoot in the morning. Well, he doesn't have a photo shoot of sorts. What does he have? Weighing of the wands and who corners him in a closet? Kind of creepy when you think about it. Rita Skeeter. Okay. Um, Sirius sends his note, tells Harry, nice try, because Harry sent the note, said stay away. 298, 299, they're going off to potions. Harry and Malfoy are arguing, and they get into a fight of sorts. Harry tries to curse Malfoy, Malfoy tries to curse Harry. Harry hits, which one, Crab? Goyle. Harry hits Goyle in the face. Who does Malfoy hit? Hermione. Where and with what? He hits her in the face with a Dins Algeo. Okay, most of the charms, they're bad Latin. Or compressed Latin. Dins, a dentist, tooth, Algeo means to increase or grow. Hermione already has buck teeth. Her two middle front teeth are larger than they should be. Okay, And what does Dins Algeo do to them? They grow down, if I remember right, we're told they get below her bottom lip and like almost to the bottom of her chin. And we see, for lack of a better phrase, Snape revealed. Top of 300. Malfoy says, look at Goyle. Potter got him. Ron says, look at Hermione. Malfoy got her. I think it's Ron. I see no difference. 
So her teeth at this point, they haven't stopped growing. Her teeth at this point, if I remember correctly, they're below her bottom lip. I mean, this is Bugs Bunny world, right? She's 14. What's, oh, I don't know. One of the things 14 year old girls are concerned about. Are they woke? 24, 34, and 44. <laughs> Appearances. Why did I say this reveals Snape? Is Snape just misunderstood? Is he really a good guy at heart? No, he's a dirty, mean, rotten SOB. Is he evil? No. No. Means you can be dirty, rotten SOBs and not be evil. Probably also means you can be dirty, rotten SOBs and be good. Okay? Not saying that he is. I'm just So um, Colin Creevy comes to get uh, not Snape, Harry to take him up for the weighing of the wands. Rita Skeeter ambushes him, pulls him into the closet because she's creepy that way. Um, and Harry watches her quill as she asks questions, start writing his answers. Sometimes before he even speaks and other times not writing what he says. Okay. Um, we see Ollivander again. And who do we get introduced to? Who's going to show up later on? I think he's referred to in book six, and we're going to see it. he is in book six, and we're going to see him again in book seven. Grigorovich, another wand maker. Okay. Harry gets another note from Sirius, page three twelve. Says we need to meet. This is important. November twenty second, Gryffindor fireplace. He says, stay around Dumbledore and Moody. Just things are dangerous. I know you can protect yourself, just, you know. Chapter 19. We get the first of Rita Skeeter's scoops, or the first of her articles, okay? And this one's about what? Harry's broken heart, or Harry's love. Who is Harry's love interest? According to Rita, Hermione, an average looking girl, okay? Um, Hagrid, November 22nd, comes around. I'm skipping a bunch. I'm skipping all this stuff. Well, yeah, I am. Um, 322. I'm skipping most of the stuff about spew. 322. Harry's got his invisibility cloak on. They're in Hogsmeade. And Moody says, right exact middle of that page, nice cloak, Potter. Harry's surprised. Can, can, can you? Yep, yeah, it can see through invisibility cloaks. It's coming useful at times, I can tell you. Just kind of let that hang there throughout the next several books until we get to book seven. I think it's a problem, okay? We'll see when we get to book, assuming we ever get to book seven. Um, so they go on and talk about the elves and such, and then Harry meets Hagrid, and Hagrid takes Harry along with him on his, what do you want to call Hagrid is doing that evening? He's on a date of sorts with Madame Maxine. Harry's going along under the cloak, you know, third wheel, so to speak. Why does Hagrid invite Harry along? He wants to let Harry know what he's up against, okay? Who else does Harry see? So he sees Madame Maxine. She sees dragons. What does Harry infer from that? It's not stated directly, so he infers it. She's going to tell Fleur, right? He sees Karkaroff. 
he infers Karkaroff is going to tell Krum. So Harry knows, Fleur will know, Krum will know. Who won't? Cedric. 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 Okay. Skip a bunch. Harry has his meeting with Sirius. Sirius says he's heard strange things. He's been watching things. He talks about Bertha Jorkins, who's gone missing. Says she's an idiot and such. Okay. And he has to leave before he can tell Harry what to do with the dragon. 340, 341. There's now like a day or two days. Uh, a day before the first task comes up. Harry catches Cedric in the hallway, makes his bag split so that his books fall out, so he's late, so he can talk to him. 340. Um, Harry says, very bottom of the page, Cedric, first task is dragons. So he's leaning over, he's helping Cedric get his bags uh, books together. What? Dragons. They've got four. One for each of us. We've got to get past them. Are you sure? Yes. I've seen them. How'd you find out? We're not supposed to know. Never mind. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Right? Harry doesn't want to do what? Get Hagrid he doesn't want to out Hagrid. Okay? I'm not the only one who knows. Fleur and Crum, Crum will know by now. Maxime and Karkaroff saw the dragons too. So, Harry has just now made sure it's a level playing field. They all know. Cool. Except what does Cedric ask? Why? Why are you telling me? Harry looked at him in disbelief. He was sure Cedric wouldn't have asked that if he had seen the dragons himself. Harry wouldn't have let his worst enemy, well, you know, Malfoy or Snape, maybe. It's just fair, isn't it? Is fairness a quality of Gryffindors? Not necessarily. It is a quality of Hufflepuffs. Okay? If your one is just loyal, honest, and true, then one is fair. But if one is chivalrous, brave, courageous, and shows daring, not necessarily, okay? Chivalry might incorporate fairness. We'll talk about chivalry a little bit more later. So, Moody comes up, tells Cedric to get off to class, takes Harry into his dungeon, Tells him to sit down. Harry looks around and, you know, sees all those magical contraptions and says, so, found out about the dragons. And Harry's like, yes. Doesn't want to out Hagrid. He says, don't worry. Cheating is part of the part of the unwritten rules for the Triwizard Tournament. And he tells Harry uh, da, 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 da. Where is it? I, use, I mentioned it in my first class. He said, that was a very decent thing you just did. Where? It's on 343 or 344. That was a very decent thing you just did? Yeah, where? 342, middle of the page. Oh, there it is. Very decent. I was looking at the wrong page. Okay. Let that sentence stay in your mind until you get to the end of this book and it kind of will reverberate through the other books because we're going to see Harry do... I've never made this connection before, but I think it applies. We're going to see Harry do a very decent thing at the end of book seven. Something that you don't expect him to do. Well, <laughs> and something that the film doesn't include. Um, so, Moody asked, you know how you're going to get to the dragon? Uh, don't have a clue. 
Play to your strengths. This is like Gandalf telling Frodo, you have to use what strength, wits, and heart you have. And Frodo's like, I don't have any of those. Harry says, I don't have any strengths. If I say you have strengths, kid, you have strengths. What's Harry's happy thought? Now, at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban, it was what? What enabled him to fight off the Dementors? Is it because he'd already done it? Yeah, kind of. It was the thought that Sirius was his godfather and he would get to go live with him and never see the Dursleys. But before that, in practicing with Lupin, what enabled him the first time to stop the barber? That he really did. Meditation. Flying. Flying. And he, I can fly. Okay, Harry, so you're really good at flying. Come on, think, kid. What do you need? And it takes him a bit, but he finally does figure it out. Broom! How are you going to get your broom? It takes him a little bit. He finally figures it out. What have they been studying in Flitwick's charms class? So many charms. Oxio broom. Get what you need, Moody tells him. Okay? So, first task. Bottom of 349. Ludo Bagman tells them, you're going to have to get from the thing that's in this bag, from the one you're going to pull out, you're going to have to get a golden egg. Okay? You got to get around the thing that's in the bag and get this golden egg. A little bit of side trivia history. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. I think it's relevant in, in uh, not just relevant. I think Rowling might have known about it. Let me put it that way. For the golden egg. What's in the golden egg? Clue to the next task, right? So it's not just an egg. It's not hollow. It's not, you know, you can't open it or anything. In the Second World War, if you've seen the movie The Imitation Game, I'm trying to remember if this comes up. I don't think it does. Um, in the Second World War, one of the big difficulties for the Allies was the Germans were using code. And we didn't understand the code. So the Brits and the Americans got a bunch of um, geeks together, essentially, and they figured out how to build a machine that would crack the German code, okay? The Enigma machine. And once they figured out how it worked, okay, they were able to intercept German messages, input that into the machine, and it would output like a ticker tape, okay, it would output a message, all right? This message, when it was spat out from the machine, would be, I think, rolled up and put into something and delivered directly to the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. It was put in a golden egg. Literally, that only Churchill saw. He was the only one who saw the message. And then he would involve his ministers, advisors, etc., and they would figure out what to do. Um, I'm not positive that Rowling knew that. It just seems awful coincidental if she didn't. Okay? So, skipping most of the first task, we find out Harry can fly really well. He does a good job. Notice the task itself takes how long in the book? I mean, Harry's part. Not skipping floors and crumbs and segments. Just Harry's part. Couple pages in the film? Oh, it's like 15 or 30 minutes. Why? CGI. <laughs> so they can have the dragon fly all over the Scottish Highlands and destroy parts of the castle, the whole nine yards. I've not been to Warner Brothers, but probably there's a ride there somewhere involved. Okay. What happens at the end? 
the end of the task. I mean, literally, it's almost like the very end of the chapter. It's the last like three pages or so. Put it more accurately. Ron finally believes Harry. Ron makes up with Harry. Okay. Notice Harry's still a little, little standoffish. It's like, hey man, you ditched me. Okay. You, you grovel. Come on, knees, class, whole nine yards. But they do. They make up. Okay. Seemingly to stick together through thick and then from then till death do them part. Mm, not so much. House Elf Liberation Front. Skipping a bunch. Rita Skeeter again. Uh, Hagrid gets in trouble. Dobby shows up. Winky shows up. And we find out Dumbledore is paying Winky and such. What is the House Elf Liberation Front? It, the name literally has echoes of a terrorist group. ELF. What was the first word? It was Liberation Front. Environment Liberation Front? Something like that. Actual group in the United States. Um, Know somebody very closely who was involved in it, got arrested, two years in a prison for juveniles and everything for trying to blow up cement trucks and stuff. But this is the House Elf Liberation Front. Think about what Hermione's trying to do, right? She's trying to free the Hogwarts House Elves because they're House Elves, which means they are slaves. slaves. They're Dumbledore slaves. How are they treated? Are they treated like slaves? No. We find out that conversation. Dumbledore wants to pay Winky. Winky won't take the payment. He does pay Dobby. Okay. What else did Dobby want? One day He wanted a day off. What did Dumbledore offer? Like weekends. And Dobby's like, no, no, I can't take that. He's, you know, Life insurance, health policy, whatever else, you know. Dumbledore's more than willing to give them everything they want, okay? What, and I'm not going to spend hardly any time on this. What must Hermione do to the house elves in order to, quote, unquote, liberate them? What must she get them to think? Freedom is good. Mm. And they're worthy of that. Okay, they're worthy of that. Freedom is good. That they're being mistreated. That they have what kind of lives? lives think, of, think of Dobby's previous life with the Malfoys. Pretty bad, right? Harry said, Psh, this makes like living with the Dursleys. Good. Does Dobby have that life now? No, Dobby's got it made. I mean, everything's great for Dobby. Everything's great for Winky. What's the, imp well, except for Winky wants to go back to Barty Crouch. What's the implication for all of the house elves at Hogwarts? They're treated well. Well, better than most. Are they, in the traditional nomenclature, slaves? No. But she has to get them to enter into a mindset of slavery. Why? So she can then free them. What's it ultimately all about? Is it about the house elves? It's about Hermione. <laughs> kind of like being what? Harry. Savior. Deliverer. All that kind of stuff. Okay? Rowling doesn't do anything with it after this book. Why not? she realizes this is not going to end well for rolling so I think she realizes I have opened a can of worms because it's forcing in one sense an ideology on somebody who doesn't want to accept that ideology it's forcing a world view 
a way of looking at the world that they don't have. Okay? So, skipping a bunch. Um, unexpected task. What is the unexpected task? And who does it involve? Is the unexpected task only for the four house champions? Or school champions? No, it's not. It's all of them, right? Ron has to get a date. Harry's got to get a date. Okay. Crumb's got to get a date. Fleur's got to get a date. Cedric's got to get a date. Not going to be a problem, right? I mean, Mr. Pretty Play. And Harry's got to get a date. Yeah, it's going to be a problem. Um, Fleur, oh, what does she have to do to get a date? Kind of go, <laughs> you know, do a Vila thing, and you know the guys come scrambling, kind of a thing. Crumb, I mean, come on, he may not be that handsome, but he's Victor Crumb. What girl's going to turn him down, kind of a thing? Um, Cedric, again, who was Crumb? Uh, who was Cedric? Roger Pattinson. Think Chris Hemsworth when he was young, okay? Like really. What girl, again, is going to turn him down? And then there's Harry. Gawky, knobbly knees, scrawny, growing a little bit, but he's just, he's like a spider in human form. He doesn't move normally. Just weird, right? Ron, Harry on steroids. <laughs> it's just another way of putting it, okay? So the task is you got to get a date and go to the Yule dance, the Yule ball. Who do Harry and Ron end up with? Padme. And why? Padme and Parvati Patil, the twins. What is their ethnicity? Their nationality is English. Their ethnicity is either Indian or Pakistani. I can never remember. Because there's a difference between Patil, I-L, and Patel. I think Patel is Pakistani and Patil is Indian. Okay, how do they look when they come down for the ball? Amazing. Drop dead gorgeous. Okay, who else is drop dead gorgeous when she comes down for the ball? Hermione. How drop dead gorgeous is she? Enough that both Harry and Ron notice. Or... Well, at first they don't know who she is okay. because that's not Hermione. Hermione's hair is normally what? This is what Emma Watson. Cute, all that, not well cast, or maybe well cast, but what should the hairdresser have done? Made her hair a lot more. <laughs> yeah, you know, stick her finger in a light socket, man. I mean, her hair should be bushy, we are told. It never really is, all right? How's the Yule Ball go for them? Them, Harry and Ron? Not, not great. Why not? They can't dance, they don't really know how to with girls, so just kind of crashes and burns. Okay, so really what's Harry's problem? The girl he wanted to go with is with Cedric. Who is? Cho. Cho. And we can pretty, it's pretty much, we don't need to say much more about Cho, right? To me, she's like Colin Creamy. Kill her off early, be done with her. Just, <laughs> it's just me, sorry. Don't mean to offend. Um, Ron? What language does Ron use for what Hermione is doing? He actually uses the phrase fraternizing with the enemy. With the enemy. And she's like, Ron, he's not the enemy. This is magical international cooperation. I'm old enough to remember when the Olympics were not simply a sporting event. The Olympics were what? The Cold War in athletic events. That's it. You had the United States, Great Britain, West Germany, ultimately France a little bit, against East Germany and the Soviet Union. And it was all about one thing. We're going to beat you down to the ground. Okay, not literally. We're not going to war, but our athletes are going to beat you down to the ground, okay? What's the purpose of the Yule Ball? The 
kind of bring unity or to bring unity? Yeah. To fraternize with the enemy, essentially. Okay? Some people are doing a little more fraternizing than, than the others, right? Like, who do Harry and Ron see once they leave the Yule Ball outside in the bushes? Snape and um, the head of the Yeah, okay, but, dude, that gives me the willies because I was thinking of a couple. Oh. <laughs> and Snape and Carcroft, I don't want to think <laughs> about at all. I'm thinking Fleur and Oliver Davies, who are snogging in the bushes. Okay? Crumb and Hermione are talking. Hagrid and Madame Maxime are... Hmm, what do we want to call what's going on there? <laughs> it is not a meeting of the minds by any means, right? So, the unexpected task does not go well. Oh, I didn't even mention this in my first class. What's Ron wearing? <laughs> that look like? Well, no, they're out of fashion. They're old. But it looks more like what than what? In that two-word phrase, dress robes, more like a dress than like robes. It's why Harry does something that he does at the end of the novel, by the way. Okay? So, skipping a bunch. What happens at the end of the task? What does Cedric do for Harry? Is that payback for Harry telling him about dragons? Yes. Is it equal? Sakari, so you're shaking your head no. Why not? Does your egg do anything when you open it? No. Take a bath. Really? That's it? With the egg. He could. With yeah, with the egg. He, he could say what? The egg has the clue for the next task. Or he could say, we've got to get something we will miss. And we have an hour to do it. It's not a... I'm sorry. That is not an even clue to what Harry told him. Okay? Another Rita Skeeter scoop. What's it about? Dumbledore. What's it really about? Uh, Hagrid. What do we find out? Finally. We kind of knew it. Assumed it, maybe. Hagrid's what? Half-giant. Half-blood. First of all. Half-giant, half-wizard. So... Intrust species, because giants aren't human. They're they're human-like, humanoid, but they're not human, okay? So they're back at Hogmaid, four fifty-one. Hermione sees Rita Skeeter. Harry says something about Hagrid. Hagrid's cool. I like Hagrid. He's my friend. Rita's like, really? Tell me you're in her mind just jumps down her throat. You horrible woman. You don't care, do you? Anything for a story. Anything, anyone will do. One thing. Even Ludo Bagman. And Rita shuts her down. She says, I could tell you things about Ludo Bagman that would curl your hair. Not that you don't need that. Or not that you need that. Because her hair is naturally curly. What does she know about Ludo Bagman? We're going to see it later on. Oh, could be that he has a gambling addiction, but I don't think that's it. He was accused of being in lead in cahoots with Lord Voldemort. Right? We're going to see it. I'm jumping way to the end. We're going to see a trial later on that Harry pops into that Rita Skeeter was at that Ludo Bagman was on trial for passing secrets along to the Dark Lord. All right? That's what she's referring to. We'll talk about that scene when we get
get to him. So they go back up to Hagrid's hut. Dumbledore's there. Hagrid's tendered his, tendered his resignation. Dumbledore won't take it. And Dumbledore essentially says, listen to the kids. Dumbledore leaves. Harry, Ron, and Hermione stay behind. 4.55. Hagrid shows them a picture of himself with his father. Taken just after I got into Hogwarts, he says. Dad was dead chuffed. Thought I might not be a wizard, see? Why, because me mom. Of course, I never was great shakes at magic. His father died in his second year. Has Hagrid had a, a deadly life? An easy life? No, he hasn't. We're going to find out later on why is he alone with his father? Why was he alone with his father? Because his mother left them. The other day I talked about functional, dysfunctional families. Dumbledore was the one who stuck up for me after Dad went. Got me the gamekeeper job. Trust people he does. Gives them second chances. That's what sets them apart from other heads. No, skipping a bit. Knows people can turn out okay even if their families weren't, well, all that respectable. Some don't understand that. Some would always hold it against you. Juxtapose Hagrid's statement right there with what he tells Harry, Fred, Ron, Hermione, George, Ginny, Arthur, at Flourish and Blots. What's he say about the Malfoys? Bad blood. Rotten to the core. Everyone knows, knows Malfoys aren't worth anything. What has he just said? Knows people can turn out okay even if their families weren't, well, all that respectable. Respectable means held in high opinion. It's another way of saying, even if their family was bad blood. So does Hagrid, has Hagrid quote unquote seen the light? Maybe. Or is he not thinking his own experience next to someone like the Malfoys or Draco Malfoy? The egg in the eye. Skipping a bunch. Harry gets caught out of the dormitory at night by Snape. Moody comes to his rescue of sorts. And Harry shows Moody what? The Marauder's map. Moody's like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Mind if I borrow it? What? I'm going to give away something. I'm not going to say it, but kind of giving it away. What should Harry see? Oh. How did Lupin know Peter Pettigrew was still alive? Some of you said because he saw his picture in the Daily Prophet. No. Sirius saw his picture in the Daily Prophet. Lupin saw Peter Pettigrew's name scurrying on Hogwarts grounds. The only way Peter Pettigrew's name could be on the map was if Peter Pettigrew was alive and there. That's how Lupin knew. That's why he runs off to the Shrieking Shack. Because he saw Peter Pettigrew's and then disappear into the Whomping Willow. Okay? What should Harry have seen? A name. <laughs> yeah. What should possible... Uh, there could be a possible out here. I don't think it applies. I don't think it works. But just leave that question there. So... Harry takes the bath, gets all the, you know, uh, clues and stuff, and we get the second task. What's the second task? 
in one minute. Saving your friends or friends. saving the thing you're gonna miss the most. Yeah, you can get on internet, do fan fiction slash fiction stuff, and a couple people's faces are going ew because <laughs> there's you know a lot of homo homoerotic stuff about Harry and Ron out there. <laughs> Harry gets second place. Why? Because he rescued both Ron and um, Fleur's little sister. And he was the first one there. Mm -hmm. He showed, as the judges call it, well, some of the judges, moral fiber. This. Okay. And we're going to have to stop there. I don't want to, but because we're out of time, literally. And we're going to pick up with chapter 27, Padfoot Returns. Okay. Um, we're going to finish this on Tuesday, come hell or high water. I'm going to put a quiz up. Uh, probably won't be today because I'm going to be under a lot of Novocaine and stuff in about an hour. Um, dental work. Uh, maybe this evening, probably tomorrow, put a quiz up. Probably over like chapters 1 through 20. Okay. That'll be due, I don't know, Monday or Wednesday of next week, something like that. So be on the lookout for that.